Welcome everybody to 31 on 31, the action edition. So, since we have a slow year in movies and since we wanted to do something a little bit special for all, for all of you guys for following us and being such awesome viewers, we decided to do two editions of 31 on 31 this year. So we have seven action franchises and a very special guest with Sean Chandler talks about. So you've already seen Brian and CP's video if you've been following along. Sean's video will be premiering in two hours or if you're watching this in the future, all of these videos are up and you can check down below in the video description for the links to all of them. But for this edition of 31 on 31, we decided to give the horror and the slashers a break for a couple of months and talk about one of our other favorite genres in action films. So we're coming at you with Rambo, Mission Impossible, John Wick, Lethal Weapon, Jason Bourne, Bad Boys, and Die Hard. Seven awesome, iconic action franchises. And let me tell you, this is the third 31 on 31 that I have done and by far the most difficult because Save for one film, I really enjoy all the movies on this list, and it was a bitch trying to figure out which ones fit where. My top maybe five were pretty solid, my bottom five were pretty solid, everything in the middle I went back and forth probably six or seven times, which I have never done doing any of these rankings. Usually I do my list, and that's pretty solid maybe except for one film moving after a rewatch. This was difficult. There are some awesome movies on this list, and keep in mind that all of the franchises, for all four of us that are doing these videos, have different meanings to us. We have different experiences growing up, we have different levels of nostalgia, different memories that go along with it, different things that we walk into an action film wanting. Some of us want action, some of us want blood, some of us want story, some of us want characters and character dynamics and relationships. So as always, keep in mind when you're watching these videos that we're all movie fans, we all have different subjective opinions, and this is all for fun. So please do not get all upset and pissy in the comment section below, because that's a dick move. Don't be a dick. So without further ado, guys, let's light this fucking dynamite and get this thing rolling with number 31, the bottom of the barrel, the worst of the worst as far as these 31 films. And for me personally, the only movie on this list that I actually dislike, and that is A Good Day to Die Hard. There is absolutely no justification for why this fucking piece of shit movie exists. You will find out throughout this video that I am a pretty big fan of the Die Hard franchise. I mean, hello. A Good Day to Die Hard is barely worthy of being a direct-to-video Redbox film. It has all of the problems with garbage filmmaking. It has really bad action scenes. It has absolutely terrible, bored-ass actors, including Bruce Willis. Bruce, why? Why is this in your discography? Why do you cap off your Die Hard franchise with this performance? Why? You have a ridiculous twist with the villain that you can see coming a mile away and has absolutely no effect on you whatsoever whenever the final reveal comes. You have the addition of Jai Courtney, who is an actor that, let's just say I'm not a fan of, and he adds nothing to this franchise, and he adds nothing to the McLean family. It's just bad. There's even scenes where they have recycled dialogue from Live Free or Die Hard. You were so fucking lazy in your filmmaking that you couldn't even finish out your movie yourself. You had to borrow from a better film to finish out this piece of shit. I'm done ranting on it. 31 on 31, this is the worst. Good day to die hard, 31. Oh, thanks guys, it's just what I wanted. Four movies and a bonus coaster. Number 30, now like I've said twice, from here on out, these are all movies that I at least enjoy. They go from good to great to fucking phenomenal from here on out, so we're done with the shit. Now this might get a little bit controversial because as my Rambo ranking told me, there's a lot of fans of this movie. Unfortunately, I'm just not one of them for the most part. Rambo First Blood Part Two is my number 30. Now, I did not grow up with two and three as far as the Rambo movies are concerned. I love First Blood. You will see that very high on this list. That movie is one of my favorite action dramas of all time. Two and three take a very different approach, even from four and five. It's just a weird little middle chapter in the Rambo franchise where they went ultra 80s cheese. <laughs> where it was all about the action hero. It was about the glistening muscles and you know the over the top 80s action scenes. And Rambo wasn't so much of a dramatic character anymore. He was the action guy. He was the dude on the poster with you know the, the poses and even more muscles than before. They even poked fun at it in a scene in Twins. This is a decent movie 
if you are a fan of the Rambo franchise. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there, this is their favorite, I get it, you probably grew up with it. It's just a different experience for me. For me personally, good action scenes, interesting having him back in the Vietnam setting. There is some entertainment value to be had with that 80s cheese. There's a reason why it was a cliche, because it's glorious for the most part in most of those movies of that era. I just don't prefer my Rambo movies to be of this type. I like the more darker, dramatic, a little bit grittier of a Rambo movie. This one's got a little bit too much gloss for me. I mean, for God's sakes, you got that one scene in the movie that just encapsulates what this movie is. Schwarzenegger, I'm coming to get you. Number 29 for me is gonna be Jason Bourne. This is the most recent of the Bourne franchise. Now, I will say upon rewatch, I did not dislike this movie quite as much as I did when I first saw it. And this is the first time I've rewatched it since theaters. But for me, this movie is, it has no reason to exist. I mean, there, I'll get into most of my thoughts and most of my criticisms with the Bourne franchise as a whole as we go on in this video. But for a very templated franchise and for a franchise that I think capped itself off pretty good with Bourne Ultimatum, and went into an interesting direction with Born Legacy that we'll probably never get to see for, come to fruition. More on that later. You get the Jason Bourne. I remember there was years of this big debate where everybody, all the fans, wanted another Bourne movie. You had Matt Damon and Greengrass going, nope, we're not doing another one until we find a story that justifies bringing it back. And then they finally came back. And this is the story you decide to tell? This is all the same shit we've seen before. Literally everything. I mean, look, this is the Bourne franchise in a nutshell. Step one, pick a side character that does something that causes an event to bring Jason Bourne back into the fold. Step two, he reads something that triggers some memories where he's like having a headache and we see little flashes and slowly throughout the movie they start to be pieced together. Number three, you get a whole lot of scenes like this. Where's Bourne? We need to find Bourne. Zoom in on that right there. That's not Bourne. That's Bourne right there. Follow him. Activate the asset. Wait, fuck, he killed the asset? Do we have another asset? Activate that asset. Get born. Shit, he's gone. We gotta get born. Step four, an asset is activated. It's usually a star that comes to be a much bigger star in Hollywood after these films, but most of them are recognizable faces and they square off with Bourne at some point and get their ass whooped. You have your chase scene, you have your fight scene, and then finally he meets some old white guy who's some higher up in this program that has a couple more answers for him that he did not get in the previous movie. That is the entire franchise over and over. For better or worse, that is a fact. And when you get to Jason Bourne, it's to me the least interesting of all of those aspects. It doesn't have the best fight scene. It doesn't have the best chase scene. It doesn't have the most compelling plot on why he is back at all. It doesn't even have the most interesting higher up. I mean, when you have Alicia Vikander thrown in here and she's trying to compete with Julia Stiles for the most stone-faced, emotionless character in this franchise, this movie is just pointless. It adds absolutely nothing to the franchise. But if you like your Bourne movies, this is more of the shit that Bourne movies give you. So there's some entertainment value there. Number 28 is gonna be Mission Impossible Dos, Mission Impossible 2. Now, as a kid, this was my favorite for a long time. This came out right in that sweet spot where I was just starting to become a preteen and you got the heavy metal style Mission Impossible theme. You got all the cool shit with the sunglasses and the motorcycle chases and you got the fine ass Bond girl in here with Tandy Newton and you got a very cool at the time storyline with this virus and it's all overly stylized. You get a Metallica song in there, which is one of my favorites of theirs. This had everything that I wanted at that time. Hasn't aged so well. <laughs> it's a movie where at the last time that I rewatched this, I was like, oh, what the, why do people hate this movie? This movie's awesome. And then I watched it and I went, ooh, wow. Okay, things have changed. I still think it has a lot of entertainment value. I still think that it is a fun movie. It is a product of its time. It is a product of a certain director that doesn't get a whole lot of work, especially in America anymore, because his style certainly belonged in the 90s. But, there's no getting around the fact that 30, 45% of this movie might be cut out if you just get rid of most of the slow-mo sec. Fuck. Right in the middle of a damn video and my microphone goes out. Please hold.
Number 27 for me is gonna be Rambo 3. Now, I think most people probably have Rambo Part 2 above Rambo 3, but for me, they're very close. There's only a couple of things that put Rambo 3 above Rambo 2 for me. Other than that, it gets a lot of the same criticisms that I just gave that film. I do like the fact that Troutman gets to be kind of part of the action in this one. I do like the desert setting a bit more than the jungle setting, even though that's kind of quintessential Rambo. I do like the kind of change of flavor that 3 does give us. It's got some epic ass action scenes. I think I even read that at one point this was the most expensive film ever made. I don't know how long it held that title, but you could see the budget on screen when you got a lot of explosions and you have a lot of, you know, horses and huge armies and you've got big ass helicopters and shooting missiles there's some pretty epic shit in the third act of this film still cheesy action still cheesy 80s rambo you still get those one-liners fuck them but i like it just a little bit more Number 26 is that redheaded stepchild of the Bourne franchise, The Bourne Legacy. Now, I am one of those people that actually liked this direction. I like Jeremy Renner as an actor. I think that he was a very capable, not necessarily replacement, but side character for Jason Bourne and Matt Damon. I think that the storyline was interesting enough. It certainly falls into some of the cliches and some of the template of the Bourne franchise, which does hold it back a bit. I like having Rachel Wise in here. There's some interesting things here that could have built to a nice little shared universe, if you will, of Bourne characters. They could have even got a third actor at some point. And if I'm being honest, I didn't mention this in Jason Bourne, but part of my initial disappointment with that film was that they didn't acknowledge this one at all. I figured by the end of that one, they would introduce Jeremy Renner's character either, either as an antagonist or as a partner for Jason Bourne, and then we would get another film where they would team up or go against each other. That's what I want to see out of this franchise. I think that would be a nice little break from the template. But going back to Born Legacy, some cool action sequences, interesting enough as a side cool. But because it's pretty clear now that they're not gonna acknowledge this film at all, we're not gonna get any more from this character, from this storyline, it really holds it back for me because it just feels like the first chapter of a book where the rest of the pages were torn out. Number 25 is the Born Supremacy. Now, a lot of people seem to have this near or at the top of their ranking for Born films. To me, this this seems to be everyone's idea of what the quintessential Bourne movie is. And I can understand that in certain stylistic ideas of what this film kind of brings because this is the first green grass Bourne film. It does take a little bit of a different style from the Bourne identity and which kind of became the style going forward in the franchise. This does set that. But for me personally, aside from kicking off in a very dramatic and cool way with the death of his girlfriend and you know, having Carl Urban as this rival assassin that came this close to killing him and him kind of taking the fight to Treadstone. I like the initial setup. To me, this movie really does meander a lot with the plot. There's not really a whole lot going on in this movie aside from where it opens. A couple of cool scenes where he's looking through a scope at Pamela Landy and, you know, you look tired and they're like, what the fuck? There's things like that that's cool. But story-wise, this movie just doesn't really bring a whole lot that interests me. I've seen it six or seven times. It's enjoyable enough. It's a decent chapter in here. It's just nowhere near my favorite of this franchise. 24 is Lethal Weapon 3. Now, this is enjoyable. I actually enjoyed this a lot more upon this most recent rewatch. This has always been my least favorite of the Lethal Weapon franchise because to me, the plot here involving the dirty cop that is able to just walk into a police station and shoot a guy and walk right back out and has no fucks to give whether or not they realize that it's him and they realize it pretty quick. Things like that, the template of this particular franchise, which if we're gonna talk about like the Bourne franchise being a template, Lethal Weapon certainly is guilty of that too. Getting a little bit stale by the time you get here. I like Rene Russo's addition, but at the same time, the romance with her and Riggs is good, but it doesn't really add a whole lot of new flavor to this movie, not like with Leo's introduction in two. It's a fun movie, don't get me wrong. I don't mean to focus on the negatives, just to kind of justify where it is in this list. I have to kind of tell you why it gets held back a bit. It's still fun. It still has all of the character dynamic between Riggs and Murtaugh that you love in this franchise. It still has some cool shootouts. The villain's interesting enough, and the whole thing with the armor-piercing bullets is an interesting little addition here for a uh, late 80s early 90s action film but the things that it does well i just think are done better in the other lethal weapon movies that will be higher in this list 
23, we got Brian De Palma's Mission Impossible, which is a very weird film in the franchise now. Now that we're all the way to Fallout, and you see how epic and just huge the action has gotten in this franchise, whenever you go back to rewatch this original film, it's always weird, because this is definitely a totally different genre. This is barely even an action film, honestly. There's some cool iconic stuff, like with the dropping down on the zip line to get the knock list out of the computer and the helicopter explosion at the end. There's some cool action stuff here, but 70, 80% of this movie is just espionage drama. And it's good, it's good for what it does, but it's just an oddball. And a lot of my love for this movie, honestly, I talked about this on Autop Stream, it's some nostalgic love for the N64 video game. I actually got that from the video store once and I just kept playing it and replaying it, and especially the mission where you go down in the zip line, I used to always play that. And it does a pretty good job at kind of making missions out of certain chapters in the movie. So finally my dad got me the movie and it was always me watching the movie, but kind of thinking about the video game. So I always had a little bit of nostalgic love for that for this. There's some cool characters in here. You know, you got the introduction of Ving Rhames as Luther Stickle. Uh, I even like the John Voight and the whole twist there, even though I know a lot of people that love the TV show hated it. They do have a very funky way of revealing that twist where you have this little meeting and Ethan Hunt is like, putting things together in his head, but the way that they visualize it just really is weird for the viewer to absorb. I've always thought that. And the fact that they kill off the entire team in the first 15 minutes of the movie is odd as for a Mission Impossible movie, because as this franchise goes on, it's all about the dynamic of the team. It's all about the personalities and you know the back and forth of Ethan and whoever this, these new people are that are added to his team. But when you get Emilio Estevez and all these other characters that are just wiped out, it's basically a Tom Cruise vehicle the entire time. It's an entertaining Tom Cruise vehicle, but when you start stacking up against all the other movies on this list, this is where it's gonna fall. Number 22, John McClane is back. Die Hard to Die Harder. Now this is another film that I enjoyed a lot more on this most recent rewatch. This one was always my least favorite until A Good Day to Die Hard came along, and it's because it very much takes the template of the original film and it's even self-aware at how similar that it is with some of the dialogue of the characters, but oh, we're just, we're in this shit again, John. It's entertaining for the fact that it has that template because it's a proven template, and this feels the most like the first film in tone and with the score and with the style of the movie, but it's just the plot of the first film just not done anywhere near as good, so it's a positive and a negative at the same time. I got enough friends! <laughs> I like the villain with William Sadler and kind of the different storyline going on. I like the airport as a setting. There's some good stunts here, some very good lines from John McClane. I mean, he's firing on all cylinders like most of these movies. It's a very entertaining, over-the-top, Rennie Harlan-style action film. But it's not as cool, as inventive, or as interesting as some of the Die Hard films that are going to be above it. So entertaining but not near the top of this list. Now these next two films, I gotta admit, even though they're towards the middle, I really struggle with which ones I like more. There are two Rambo films that are gonna be 21 and 20. I'll go ahead and tell you that now. And when I did my ranking of the Rambo franchise and did my reviews, it was pretty clear to me which one was the better of these two until I found the extended cut of Rambo Last Blood. Now, Rambo Last Blood was a movie that had some problems for me, but had a lot of entertainment value with its setup and especially its conclusion. And the extended cut fixed a lot of what my issues were with the film, with not really being able to understand where Rambo was as a character. But it's still gonna be just a little bit less good than Rambo for me. So number 21 is going to be Rambo Last Blood. For now, over time it might get a little bit better, but as I was saying, there's a lot of people that are really highly critical of this film for somewhat of an understanding reason for me, but I would say give the extended cut a shot because it adds about 10 minutes to the opening of this film that really makes it feel more like a Rambo film. That was my main thing. This felt like a Sylvester Stallone revenge flick and not so much of a Rambo film. The things that they do and the where that they put Rambo as a character with his PTSD and where he is as a person makes this feel like more of a follow-up to the previous film. This has a really interesting story where he has this family, he has this young girl that he's basically a surrogate father for. She goes off to Mexico to find her biological father against his wishes, ends up getting caught up with this cartel that strings her out and makes her a drug addict and a hooker and all this other stuff. 
and Rambo basically has to go and try to get her back and eventually just lay waste to this entire cartel in the final act of this film, which I don't remember it being as violent as it was when I watched it at home. I was like, oh my God, he's fucking them up. If you like your Rambo film in this style, like Rambo 4 and Rambo 5, to where it's just absolute carnage in the third act, I think Last Blood has a lot of entertainment value for you. With that being said, there is still some familiarity to this plot. It doesn't necessarily reach for the stars with originality. It's just here to deliver a very solid action revenge experience. And despite the shortcomings that come along with most of the films of that genre, I think that this one is still pretty entertaining and delivers a mostly satisfying maybe end to the Rambo franchise. And following it by a hair is number 20, which is Rambo or Rambo 4, whatever you want to call it. This is the one where this was the big comeback of Rambo. This was after you had Rocky Balboa come out, kind of reestablish Sylvester Stallone into his career for the most part, and then he revisited his other iconic character in Rambo and turn those blood and guts meters up to 12 because this movie is violent as hell. Not even just on the revenge side, but just in the way that they establish these villains where they're throwing kids into fires and they're making people run across minefields and just mowing down innocent people. They establish hard that you are supposed to hate these characters and my God do you to the point where when it comes to the third act, and Rambo finally comes and helps these missionaries and gets onto that machine gun and just starts laying waste to these guys. You're like, fuck yeah, mow them down, bitch. It just delivers what I like in a Rambo film. It, again, it doesn't go for quite the dramatic stakes that the first film kind of really resonates with me for and really makes me love and appreciate that film for, but it goes back to that hard, gritty, kind of PTSD broken person who's lost in the world that I like this character to be. And it makes sense within this story. It makes sense within this whole context of these missionaries that want to believe in the greater good, but his grizzled war hardened heart just won't take it. And he's just like, look, you're going to die. And then he ends up being the one being right by the end. It's just, it's a movie that delivers a subtle enough message with some not so subtle, uh, violence and some blood and guts, but it's a damn good time. Like, just like with Rambo Last Blood, if you like that kind of revenge style, just explosion of blood and guts. Number 19 is gonna be Bad Boys 2. Now, this might be a little controversial because it seems like a lot of people that love the Bad Boys franchise seem to prefer the second one for the over-the-top action. I'm gonna die on an island and say that that's actually one of the reasons why it's my least favorite of the three, while being a movie that I love. Again, I love all these movies except for one. Bad Boys 2 has a lot of good things going for it. It raises the stakes, it raises the action significantly. You have all that dynamic chemistry between Will Smith and Martin Lawrence that's just turned up throughout the entire movie. It's a very fun, entertaining, joyous, blood-soaked good time. But in comparison to the other two films, I feel like they're joking around a bit too much in this movie. Dead man on the wall. Dead man. Oh, oh, ah, I'm trying to get, get it off. off. Trying to get it off. Oh. I like the fact that the Bad Boys movies, at least where it started off, felt like a mostly grounded cop story where there is some action, there is some over-the-top Michael Bay stuff in the first film, but it's grounded. It's not like these guys are superheroes. And then you get to Bad Boys 2, and they're basically demolishing the entire city of Miami, the entire, you know, Cuba at one point. They're just mowing down all these people with these fucking Hummers. There is some really fun action, but it really pushes it as far as the Michael Bay stuff with just being style over substance for me. Again, depending on what mood I'm in, that might not even be a negative. I might love Bad Boys 2 if that's all I want to see, and there's times where I absolutely love it. But uh, there is some things about that over-the-top nature that does hold it back slightly for me while being a damn good time as far as buddy cop movies go. Number 18 is Lethal Weapon 4. Now for a long time, this was the Lethal Weapon movie that I had watched the most because this was the one that I saw first. I think I went to the theater with my dad to see this and I had not seen the previous movies yet. 
Uh, this was my introduction as well as most of us Americans to Jet Li, and I think Jet Li is easily the best villain in the Lethal Weapon franchise. Arguably with, you know, Mr. Joshua in the first one, but Jet Li is badass in this. I like the storyline involving like these, you know, these triads or yakuza's i forget exactly what gang that they're in but uh jet lee and his gang trying to basically smuggle this family in they're trying to print money to buy them you have Riggs and murtaugh that are thrown into this at the very beginning when they're just out in their fishing boat uh, you have them kind of giving sanction to this family which brings a real fun dynamic to the murtaugh family i like renee russo being a pregnant woman but still being able to kick ass and uh, i love leo gets in this has some great lines some great interaction with chris rock who surprisingly actually adds a good bit of humor to this movie. Not that he's not a funny guy, but he's not necessarily the best actor in the world. So you throw him into a franchise, it's always kind of a toss up if he's gonna add something or if he's gonna overshadow it with his explosive personality that's great for stand up. But I have a lot of fun with this. I think that the humor is turned up. It might be the funniest of the Lethal Weapon movies, certainly in competition with the second one for me. There's some great action scenes, some good stakes, and a kick-ass villain. So I don't have a whole lot negative to say about Lethal Weapon 4 other than the fact that it is more Lethal Weapon stuff. So it is a little bit templated, but I have a damn good time with it. Number 17 is going to be John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum. Now this was a movie that raised quite a few spots upon rewatch. Because if you go back to my review when I first saw it, although I was highly entertained by the action, and who wouldn't be, the story and some of the elements with what John Wick does throughout this film and certainly the way that it, it wraps up at the end kind of left me a bit cold to where I was a bit disappointed because I really love John Wick 2, as you will see later on. But I felt this was going to be a follow-up that was going to hopefully top John Wick 2 and it just felt like there were some things in there regarding the middle chapter of this film, like the middle act, the, the whole journey to the desert to chop off his finger, to get let back into the high table, to go and kill Ian McShane's character just to get there and immediately go back on that. And it's like, well, why the fuck did you even go through all of that in the first place if you were just gonna go off on your deal? But with all that being said, as well as the weird maybe double cross at the very end that threw me for a loop, um, the action in this one is possibly the best of the franchise. I mean, the first 30 minutes or so of this film is just like one extended action sequence. You get this fight with the library, with this book, immediately going into this whole thing with knives, and it's one of the more memorable scenes in the movie, and then you go to these horses that are kicking dude's ass, and then you get a, a horseback fight, and then just, it's insane the amount of action that they're able to cram scene after scene after scene. The choreography is great. You'll hear me rant on this a bit later on with some other franchise, but uh, the camera is actually fucking still and you can see everything in this choreography. My God, what a godsend that is. John Wick Chapter 3 has a ton of entertainment value and I can understand this being maybe near the top or at the top for some John Wick fans, specifically because of the action alone. It was just the plot and some of the things going on with the John Wick character that didn't make sense to me that holds this back a bit as far as the franchise, but my God, what a kick-ass movie. Number 16 is gonna be The Bourne Identity. Now, this is a movie that when it first came out kind of threw everybody for a loop. This, for the most part, kind of reinvented how we want to see action at the time for a lot of reasons. I mean, you have kind of the the very quick, brutal, the way that they shoot the fight scenes that was pretty new for the time. It hadn't been anything even close to that since like The Matrix. It was kind of a new, more brutal way to do espionage action. Then you have the casting of Matt Damon, who was totally against what you would think a character like this would be cast as. This is a guy that was doing movies like The Talented Mr. Ripley, and then you're like, oh, he's gonna be a spy and kicking people's ass now. Everybody went, what? The dude who hangs out with Ben Affleck. And then you watch the movie and he's perfect. He introduces, just like how John McClane did back in the 80s, a new way to view an action hero or an action star and kind of reinvented how we wanted to see our action stars or what we were willing to accept as an action star back in the 2000s. It also has a really good story that is a story that I've seen a couple of times. You know, there's like the Long Kiss Goodnight, which I actually prefer to this movie. I might die on an island with that one too, but the Born Identity being this amnesiac story where this person knows all this stuff that they don't know how they know and can kick a bunch of ass and doesn't understand why going on this journey to figure out why they can kick so much ass 
it's entertaining. It is a good story. It is told well. It does have some good style to it. Doug Lyman is a very good director and does good with action. You get a good car chase. You get some good fight scenes. You get a good little um, throwdown with another, I believe it was the professor was his name, another assassin played by Clive Owen. It's a very solid action film that kicked off what at the time was like the new big badass action from franchise. Number 15, beating out Born Identity by a Hair is the original John Wick. Now, it, depending on my mood, those two movies might go up and down because where Born Identity has more of the espionage, John Wick has more of the action. John Wick came out of absolutely nowhere for everybody. I think the trailer even came out like a month before the trailer or the movie released. Everybody was like, what the hell is this thing with Keanu Reeves? It looks like it might actually be kind of cool. And just like The Born Identity did, it kind of reignited action films for the time. Now, if you don't have action like John Wick, you ain't got shit. But moving beyond all of the very kick-ass action that this movie has, which is the main selling point of it, what I love about it is the fact that it has this very subtle world building. You know, John Wick has this whole assassin's universe that slowly gets fleshed out throughout these movies where you have things like the Continental Hotel, you have these rules of assassins, you have the high table that's kind of running the whole thing where they can only do certain things in certain places. You go to some places that are sanctuary and even though you might have a mortal enemy across the, uh, the way or somebody that has a hit out on you, they're not allowed to do anything while you're on that premises. All of that stuff that just kind of fleshes out this world is what makes this movie stand out to me. Like Willem Dafoe's character is great as like this friend that comes back to help John Wick. It just does a great job of elevating what should be the only thing this movie is worried about, which is the action, and giving us just a little bit more to chew on. Number 14 is going to be the original Bad Boys. Now, I don't know, I might be the only person that has this movie this high. Bad Boys has always been one of my favorites of the buddy cop genre, especially this first one to me, what I love about it is how grounded it is. I talked about it a little bit when I was talking about Bad Boys 2 and how that one kind of stepped over the line a bit for me. Bad Boys, I love the grounded feel to it. Just a simple story where you have these two cops that are friends that are trying to protect this murder witness and find the killer to where he killed somebody. There's a friend of Will Smith. There's a little bit of a vendetta there. I love the little comedic switch to where in order to protect her, Martin Lawrence has to become Will Smith's character and the, the dad, the family man has to now be the playboy and Will Smith, the playboy, has to go and be the family man for a little while while this investigation is going on. But above all, what I love about this movie and these three films as a franchise is just that chemistry between Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. I mean, it's just, it's off the charts good. They might be the most chemistry-filled duels as far as the buddy cop goes. You can argue that between this and Lethal Weapon and you'll have a hell of an argument on your hands. I mean, you have the plot of Bad Boys, it's very simple, and it's kind of a well-known fact if you look into this movie that they didn't have a full script when they started it, they just had this basic idea, and most of the movie, as far as the dialogue and the character stuff, got filled out by Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, just off the cuff. A lot of this stuff was ad-libbed, a lot of it was added by them, or tweaked by them, or just kind of came naturally as they grew this chemistry with each other. And I just have a blast with this one. I have always had a spot reserved in my heart for this original Bad Boys, and it's still there. I love it. But to my, and probably everybody else's shock, Bad Boys for Life was just a little bit better than the original Bad Boys for me. Or a little bit better than Bad Boys 2 if you're a fan for that one, but Bad Boys for Life shockingly is my favorite of the Bad Boys films. And you know, it, it's a movie that I expected nothing from. I have wanted another Bad Boys movie ever since the second one because I love this franchise. And there was plenty else you could do. I mean, these actors still had plenty of juice and it took forever to get there. And then you had this development hell where you had different directors and different writers and it's on again, it's off again, it's on again, it's off again. And they finally, got some unknown directors in here and they gave it a January release date and I went, oh my God, this movie's gonna suck ass. And I went to watch it and I went, holy shit. How is this movie this good? It's way better than it has any right to be. Yes, Martin Lawrence does look like he's been uh, out of the saddle for a while, <laughs> if you just put it the most respectful way, but his chemistry with Will Smith is still there, so that makes up for it. That makes up for the way that he's kind of 
not as seasoned of an actor still as Will Smith. Will Smith certainly takes kind of the front in this movie as far as being gunned down and now being on the hunt for the guy that tried to kill him. But this movie has the most story of the three films. It has the biggest stakes. It has the best villains by far. It has the most personal touch. I mean, there's so much emotion in the story of Bad Boys for Life that wasn't really there in the first two where it was mostly just comedy and then joking around and having fun with each other. This one actually gives some emotional stuff. And it's just a damn entertaining movie. Great action scenes. Uh, they definitely borrow a little bit from like the Fast and the Furious franchise, a little bit of flavor in there, but to me it was just enough. It was just enough to kind of give a shot in the arm to Bad Boys without feeling like they're ripping off another franchise. And I am going to be very excited if and when they announce a Bad Boys 4. Number 12 is Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Now this is the movie that really like, you have the Christopher McQuarrie kind of era of Mission Impossible now that started with this one to where the action sequences get bigger than ever. And this movie is essentially multiple action sequences that is strung together by a little bit of a plot with this anti-IMF. This is not a very story heavy Mission Impossible film, but you don't really care when you watch it because some of the action sequences and some of the stuff that Tom Cruise does is just so awe-inspiring and awesome that you're like, holy shit, this movie is just a kick-ass thrill ride. I mean, from the beginning when he's on the side of the plane to some more sequences later on where he's diving into this underwater little information safe and you have the introduction of Rebecca Ferguson's character who is a great addition to this and kind of gives that very fine, subtle line between somebody who is a very complimented character to Ethan Hunt to where she can just be part of his team and this very interesting character that can kick ass alongside him. But there's enough chemistry there and enough tension to where you could see a little bit of a romantic dynamic there that they're just kind of teasing at now. They tease it a little bit more even in Fallout and we'll see with the next two films if they actually come to fruition or if they just kind of stay a little bit of that flirtation. But there's such great characters and performed by such great actors that you don't even really care. It's not like they have to hook up, but she's just a great addition to this. I love the fact that you get Simon Pegg again back in here. The team is back from Ghost Protocol and they're used very well in this. And I do like the introduction of this anti-IMF as like this brewing villain that it seems like is going to be the main villain for the four movies that McCory is going to be doing, time will tell. But this is a very entertaining movie that's just raises the stakes as far as action sequences that fill out a Mission Impossible film. Number 11 is my favorite of the Bourne franchise, and that is the Bourne Ultimatum. Now, there was a time when this and the Bourne Identity was pretty close, but on this most recent rewatch, this is the one that comes out on top for me because to me, as far as the template of a Bourne film, this has the series best of most of those things where you have this opening with this reporter that has information and these guys in CIA are trying to hunt him down. Bourne comes into the situation and you have this really cool tense sequence inside of like this subway where there's crowds everywhere and he's trying to kind of get him to go certain ways. He's got him on an earpiece and they're just maneuvering their way through these cameras and Bourne's taking out dudes left and right. And it's just a very cool, tense sequence that just starts this movie off with a bang. As far as chase sequences, you have this rooftop chase where this asset is chasing after Nikki Parsons and Jason Bourne is trying to go after him and getting chased himself by some other cops or some law enforcement of the city that he's in. And it's just a very gritty chase where, how many times have I said chase in this segment? Chase, 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 chase. He's going over glass and shit. Like he's waving stuff around his arms, going over glass, diving through windows. And then it goes into a fight that is my favorite fight of the franchise, even though you have green grass film in it. So it's fucking like this. It's a book fight scene with the asset where he ends up strangling him in the bathtub. It's the most brutal of any of the fight scenes to me. And I like the way that this movie wraps up. You know, it doesn't go the typical action route where there's this huge explosive confrontation in the third act. Most of the movie is kind of front loaded and then it goes to where he just gets all this information out there and fucks up this whole operation by getting it all out there and then just kind of escapes. So it kind of ends on more of a quieter note, but to me, 
I actually kind of like that direction. I actually think that it kind of makes this movie stand out a little bit. So I don't have a whole lot negative to say about Ultimatum aside from it's just the Bourne template, but it's the Bourne template done best in my opinion. Top 10, baby, here we go. Kicking it off with Live Free or Die Hard. And let me say this clearly now. I am only acknowledging the rated R cut of this film. There gets, there's so much flack out there given by action fans and Die Hard fans that this was the PG-13 Die Hard. Well, if you got the Blu-ray, bitch, just watch the rated R cut because that's everything that the movie was shot to be. The studio just dumbed it down for release for some fucking stupid ass reason. But even the PG-13 cut of the movie is damn entertaining. But the rated R cut, it's the only one that I ever watched. So that's the one that we're talking about. This is a kick-ass die-hard film. Yes, it's over the top. Yes, by the end of it, John McClane is basically like a superhero, and that is a negative that holds this back. That's why it's only in number 10 and not at like number three, because I love my die-hard. But this movie has a very, very stylistic director in Len Wiseman, who I actually am a big fan of. I love his two um, Underworld films. I do really enjoy his Total Recall remake. And this movie I just think is kick ass. It starts right away with big, huge action sequences, fight sequences. It goes all the way through to the end of the movie just raising the stakes with the action, which is what you want ultimately from an action franchise like this. You get John McClane at pure John McClane, Bruce Willis. This is Bruce Willis just diving right into this character and giving us everything that we want from him. Thing like a traffic jam? Throwing a car at me? Don't stop me, huh? Him insulting criminals and, you know, hey, can we get another kung fu bitch up here real quick? Man, she was smoking hot. Too bad she's got a bottom of an elevator shaft with an SUV ran up her ass. All those little one-liners that we love this character for and have loved this character for, they're great in this. I mean, they're some of the series' best lines. Like, even though yeah, Yippie Kaye Motherfucker is, like, possibly the coolest way that he says it in the whole franchise. His chemistry with Justin Long is great. The whole New Age kind of hacker... SJW stuff that he kind of brings in and you know John McClane's kind of that grizzled action hero from the 80s and where that kind of combats itself and complements itself is awesome. You get a cool cameo by Kevin Smith that's hilarious. This is just a damn good movie. I enjoy the living shit out of it and aside from the fact that I do think it's ridiculous the last couple of action sequences where he's going in this fucking truck and the the road is caving in underneath him and he jumps onto a fucking jet. That shit is stupid, but I still smile when I watch it. Number nine, you got Lethal Weapon. Now, Lethal Weapon, the first one, I think is a very good movie. Obviously, it doesn't have to impress me. It's one of the most iconic action films of all time and one of the biggest films of the 80s. For me, I really enjoy the beginnings of this because this movie actually begins in a very dark, kind of dramatic uh, tone like this is the darkest of the lethal weapon movies where you have Riggs contemplating suicide most of the movie Yeah, you want to see crazy I'll tell you. <laughs> Now that's a real badge I'm a real cop and this is a real fucking gun You have this young girl who kills herself at the very beginning of it That is the daughter of somebody that Murtaugh knows and now there's kind of that vendetta with Murtaugh and even when they get together and there's that initial tension that you have in most of these buddy cop films where they don't really like each other. They're, some of the things that they say to each other is pretty dark. And then eventually they kind of warm up to each other and the movie comes into its own and you get some good action, but that chemistry, just like with the Bad Boys films, is the same with the Lethal Weapon films where that's the heart of it. That's why you watch these and it's great in Lethal Weapon. And then you get some very huge dark shit at the end of the movie where they almost kill the whole family, the Murtaugh family, and you've got Riggs strung up getting electrocuted and he's breaking dudes necks with his legs and Mr. Joshua is this interesting villain, this whole thing going on with these, you know, ex-Special Forces guys that are trying to bring drugs in. It's a very cool movie that does stand out in these four films to me for being the darkest and the grittiest. So I enjoy the hell out of it. It's Lethal Weapon. What more do I need to sell you on? Number eight is Mission Impossible 3. Now, this was another movie that went up quite a bit in this list upon most recent rewatch because I've always enjoyed this one, but until this last time when I watched it, it's almost like I forgot how damn good this movie actually is. This was kind of like when Mission Impossible got back up onto its feet because even though I liked Mission Impossible 2 at the time, in hindsight, that was certainly a low point for this franchise. 
You get to Mission Impossible 3, you get J.J. Abrams in here in the director's chair. It's much more of that, it's action-centric, but you get a little bit more of that espionage flavor from the first film. And they give a very human, grounded storyline for Ethan Hunt to where he's now a husband. He has this woman that he is trying to, you know, love and care for, but he kind of shields her and doesn't tell her about who he really is and what his job is. And then you enter the best villain of the franchise and Philip Seymour Hoffman, and all that gets fucked up. And it's just a damn good movie with a very simple storyline about trying to get this rabbit's foot to get to F Philip Seymour Hoffman to get his wife back. It's nowhere near the epic scale of some of the later films, but it almost works better for that because you feel the character of Ethan Hunt more in this film than I think you do the rest of the franchise, really. So this is a character driven Mission Impossible film, which is not something you see a whole lot, and it's something that I really enjoy. I love the different tones that they go through to where you have some very gritty stuff, like with the countdown that the movie opens up with is very tense, very well acted by both stars. This is just a damn good movie. There's just nothing else that I need to say about it. Mission Impossible 3, for all the weirdness that surrounded it when it came out, because this was the couch jumping Tom Cruise era, this is a kick-ass entry in the Mission Impossible franchise. Number seven is gonna be Lethal Weapon 2, which has always been my favorite of the Lethal Weapon films, because to me it has all of the strengths of the original Lethal Weapon, but they add a bit more humor to it, to where this is arguably the funniest of the franchise. It's in competition with four for me, but it just adds that extra layer of flavor to where you just have so much fun watching this movie. The introduction of Leo Getz, and some of that dialogue that he's got, okay, 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 okay. They fuck you with the drive-through. That shit cracks me up every single time that I watch this movie. The way that Riggs and Murtaugh treat him, and it's just a little Joe Pesci back there. It's the dude that was just whacking dudes left and right in Goodfellas, and now he's this little wise-cracking little money launderer, but he's a blast. Even the chemistry between Riggs and Murtaugh is just off the charts funny in this, where you have the daughter of Murtaugh that goes into a condom commercial, and the rest of the movie, Riggs, is just, fucking with him about it and they put like a condom tree on his desk and some of those series best moments for me when he's sitting on the toilet and there's a bomb underneath <laughs> and Riggs has to pull him off of it. Alright. Okay. One, three. Three. One. Two. There's so many things about Lethal Weapon 2 that whenever I do like a marathon of the Lethal Weapon movies, I always look forward to watching this one the most because it just puts a smile on my face while having some great action, some very crazy villains with these, you know, diplomatic immunity and these guys that can't be taken down by the cops and they kill the girl that seemed like it was going to be the new romantic love for Riggs and five minutes later she's fucking out of there. This is just a damn good movie. I love Lethal Weapon 2. Number six is going to be John Wick Chapter 2. This is what I want from an action film. John Wick was a damn good movie that I definitely loved. John Wick Chapter 2 took everything that I loved about John Wick and made it better. The story's more interesting, the villain's more interesting, they flesh out the lore even more, the stuff with the Continental gets brought up even more and just kind of expands and just opens up this world of the assassins and makes it that much more interesting and that much more of this this place that I want to explore in more films. The action sequences all get ramped up and there's a lot of different variety in how John Wick is killing people with a pencil I and mean, you got some scenes where they're like in the middle of a crowd and they're trying to be subtle so they're like that stuff is great the whole rivalry that he has with common throughout this movie where they keep fucking each other up and then eventually they're fighting and they bust into the continental and he's like all right gentlemen go sit down and have a drink at the bar and they're like fuck all right what do you want scotch and even the way that the movie ends i think is just kick-ass to where it just shows how much john wick does not give a fuck when he is pissed off I love John Wick Chapter 2. This is why this movie was so damn good that I was disappointed by John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum. I mean, that's how much I love this fucking movie. Top 5. Now we separate the men from the boys, and now we grab our pitchforks and our fucking Gatling guns, and we're going to really start getting nasty in the comment sections about which one was not number 1 or number 2. Number 5 for me, and I know CP's head's going to fucking spin around three times, probably Brian's too. Hi guys! Number five is gonna be Mission Impossible 
Fallout. Now, don't get me wrong. This is number five out of 31 on a list of movies that, except for one, I am big fans of. So this is huge honor to be number five. This movie is a lot of people's favorite Mission Impossible film for good reason, because the action is the biggest and possibly the best of the franchise. The story is epic. It's a very long movie that has a lot of twists and turns and different directions that it goes. It has great villains. It has a returning storyline from Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, making it the first like section of Mission Impossible movies that stays the course with a plot and doesn't just have these individualized stories, which was interesting. You bring back those human stakes of Ethan Hunt with bringing his wife back into the danger by the end of it. It is an awesome fucking movie. The reason why it's not my favorite Mission Impossible film and why it's not higher than number five is just because the tone of the movie is very set in its ways to where it's very, not necessarily dark, but the whole movie is serious. And I'll elaborate more on my next Mission Impossible movie, why that is not necessarily a problem, but something that I don't prefer in my Mission Impossible movies. But Mission Impossible Fallout, kick ass. Can't wait for number, what is it? Seven, six, whatever the next one is. Can't wait. Number four is Die Hard with a Vengeance. This is a movie that is so damn good and so entertaining that for a lot of people, it rivals or possibly even bests the original film, which is oftentimes hailed as the greatest action film of all time. This is the perfect, damn near perfect action sequel to me. I love the way that they have the storyline where it actually takes place in New York, which is at the heart of the character of John McClane. This is the only movie thus far where he's kind of at home. I love the introduction of Samuel L. Jackson. The chemistry between him and Bruce Willis is on fucking fire this whole movie. And it's possibly the funniest of the Die Hard movies because of that chemistry and because of Samuel L. Jackson's quick wit. I love his character of Zeus. And if they do ever pull their head out of their ass and give us one more Die Hard movie, I would love if he came back. This whole storyline about the revenge of the other Gruber brother with Simon, which is awesome and kind of unexpected by the time that you get to that point in the film where it's revealed. The name Gruber mean anything to you, Lieutenant? It rings a bell, yeah. And they're sending John and Zeus around to do these little games to disarm these bombs. It's a very different storyline, but it fits Die Hard, and it's a fucking blast all the way to the end. The only flaw, the only flaw is the very end. I know there was like alternate takes or alternate scripts and they ended up coming up with this ending with this helicopter. It does seem a little bit like a convenient final confrontation, but it's just a small negative in the drop of the ocean of how awesome that this movie is. This is, oh, I love that first one, but man, I love this one. Number three is my favorite Mission Impossible movie and that's gonna be Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Now. This, for me, is what I want out of a Mission Impossible movie from start to finish. It has some epic action scenes. It has a very simple plot that does maybe hold it back for some against Fallout, which I understand. For me, where this pulls ahead of Fallout just by a hair is the comedic value and the, the chemistry of the team of this movie. That chemistry and that dynamic between Jeremy Renner, Simon Pegg, Paula Patton, and Ethan Hunt. This was my favorite team of this whole franchise. Your line's not long enough! No shit! And especially because of the comedic value. That was the one thing that was missing from Fallout for me. As great as that movie is, can't really take anything away from it. It's fucking awesome. But there's just a little bit of a hole for me with that humor that was very present in Ghost Protocol, especially from Simon Pegg. Like that whole sequence where one of the best action sequence of possibly the franchise, but definitely this movie where Ethan Hunt is scaling that glass building and Simon Pegg's just going around changing the numbers on these doors and he damn near dies and he comes in, he's like, woo, that was hard, but I did it. And like stuff like that. The whole sequence, which is one of my favorite sequences of this franchise where they have that little tarp that goes up and they can make the room to the person's perspective that's looking at it look like there's nobody behind the tarp. And then Simon Pegg like stands up for a minute and he's like picking his nose and his whole face is there. And he's like, oh, 
Stuff like that just really makes this movie stand out to me. I mean, it has all of the pros, all of the things that I love about the past two or three Mission Impossible films that I've talked about. It has all of that, plus just that little bit more of that teen dynamic and that humor that, to me, makes this my favorite of the Mission Impossible franchise. And now we have the top two, and we have two films that are the old school boys, the 80s films. Which one comes out on top? Most of you as my viewer base probably already knew what number one was gonna be before you even clicked on this damn video, but for the suspense, for those of you that are just now watching me, number two is First Blood. First Blood to me kind of rises above being your quintessential action film because of the drama that is involved with this storyline. I mean, this is the beginning of the Rambo franchise and it's such a damn good movie and such a damn good character study that as much as I love the franchise as a whole, it's one of those movies that's so good that it almost should have been a one and done because the storyline of Rambo was almost stronger being this singular interaction with this cop played by Brian Dennehy, rest in peace, to where his PTSD and the whole rejection of the Vietnam War and the Vietnam vets just kind of gets wrapped around this action-centric Sylvester Stallone movie and it's one of Stallone's, if not Stallone's, best performance as well. I mean, you have a lot of Rocky movies that can contend with that, but there's some damn good stuff in there. I mean, even Brian Lomax said on our most recent Autop stream that whenever he went back to watch the original Rambo, he was like, my God, Stallone's acting. And that's just how he is in this film. His character and that storyline that they decided to bring through with this Vietnam vet who's war-torn gets thrown into this city of these asshole cops that just bring all that PTSD back and he has to fight his way all the way back in and kind of has this one man war with the police force in this town. I love it. This is a movie that I can just endlessly rewatch and almost without exception is like a perfect viewing experience for me. I love the drama, the stakes, the grittiness of it, the whole sequence in the woods where he damn near takes all of them out in like five seconds. Don't push it. I could have killed them all. I told you, I've been telling you the law, not here, it's me. Don't push it. That shit, I love First Blood. But my number one, the best, the top of this 31 on 31, without question by a landslide, didn't even have to think about it, is the original Die Hard. I have gone on record numerous times saying that the original Die Hard is my favorite film of all time. Yes, I am a horror fanatic, but my number one film is an action film because Die Hard has everything that I could ever want from an action film and does all of it flawlessly. This is a perfect film to me. I don't care about any of the criticisms that I've heard of it. I love the movie for those things that you don't like. The character of John McClane totally reinvented what an 80s action star was and gave you this everyday man in this not everyday situation that has to rise up and be the hero and be the badass. Bruce Willis plays the role flawlessly and it kind of ignited his career to where that's the role that we will all remember him for whenever he is gone. John McClane is what I measure action heroes against. That is the guy that I like to watch. All of the full-on R-rated F-bomb filled one-liners I absolutely love the comedic value that's there in those one-liners, in his interactions with Simon Gruber and some of the other characters. Simon Gruber, possibly my favorite villain of all time, definitely in action films. That is, again, the villain that I tend to measure villains against, just the suaveness of him while being cold and calculated and just cool as a cucumber almost throughout the entire movie. Uh, even that scene whenever he tries to pull one over on McClane and McClane pulls one over on him just makes me love both characters even more. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. The action sequences, the fight scenes are very, like, down in the dirt brutal where he's just fucking beating the shit out of people and they're beating the shit out of him and he's bloodied and cut up and it's just very grounded action. It's not... 80s cheese whatsoever. This is literally looks like two dudes fighting and beating the shit out of each other. The whole storyline that gets set up that has a lot of the themes of Christmas, which is why I call this the best Christmas movie of all time. I will argue that Christmas movie shit with anyone. Bring it on down in the comment section below. Have your guns ready, no pun intended. The whole storyline with him trying to get back together with his wife to get back to his family for Christmas. And there's nothing but a whole tower full of terrorists standing between him and that. 
Everything about this movie I just love. I will do a full-fledged review of Die Hard and probably the entire franchise, if not by the end of this year, very soon, so I don't want to give all my thoughts away, but I love this movie. If I was going to get any movie that like somebody's like, look, I'm marooning you on a desert island and you're going to have power somehow and you're going to have a TV and a Blu-ray player, you can choose one film. Some people might have to contemplate that question for hours or days before they have their answer when I would probably have mine before they were finished with the sentence coming out of their mouth. Die hard, please. I'll take die hard. Number one. Thank you guys for joining us for another kick-ass time with 31 on 31. Like I said before, Brian and CP's video is already live. If you have not checked that out yet, check the link down below in the video description. Sean's will be dropping in two hours, so keep your eyes peeled for that one, our special guest. Can't wait to see what he brings to the 31 on 31 flavor. And if you're watching this in the future, all of these videos are gonna be down in the video description. So check all of these guys' lists out, see how our, com our lists compare and contrast from each other. Do your own list down in the comment section below. Let's have fun with this, guys. Don't be pricks down below about what movies you love more and why I don't agree with you. We all have our own experiences, like I've said before. Let's have a good experience down in the comment section below. Keep your eyes peeled this October for the next chapter in 31 on 31, which we've already announced subtly with a trailer, the uh, franchise that we are doing, but expect more promotional material coming soon. Like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you have not already subscribed. Also check down below for links to previous year's 31 on 31 lists that have so far all been horror. And as always guys, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker.